this is coming from being a practitioner of the trade. So right. no textbooks here. So it'll cost is not going to be very verbatim. You're not going to see it very direct. It's going to be hidden cost, right? Uh, for example, right, it's just not the value. You're going to see the value, but intrinsic value is not immediate. It's going to be over the course of time. Once the workflow goes into production, once that workflow basically hits the ROI and the metrics that we talked about earlier, right? It has a lot of metrics. You could go 40% reduction in time to treatment for, in case of healthcare, emergent cases. Yeah, recall rate uh, improves by 17% through feedback loop, right? From radiologist decision making. So there is those costs that you cannot see it right away because you decided to go away where you are putting in a agentic AI platform in place. You're doing orchestration through MCP. You brought in some hyperscalers. Great, that's the infrastructure component. When do you get to see the cost is going to be something? It's it's six to eight months when you know these things. Your your labor bears fruit, right? And that's the time. The gap between that is when the metrics come in handy. You will have to see what that human engagement participation is. Number of percentage of employees actively engaged with AI, right? Just not using a co-pilot or something that was implemented by the organization, but blind, not ex blindly accepting it, but making sure they're tracking it. We are making sure we understand what that uh, resp response time is coming from the implementation of AI, from accuracy and error reduction. Once you put the AI in place, what was my percentage of decrease in false positives, false negatives after a human review? Those are the things that I will be going after from a metric standpoint. And then the quantifiable uh, cost is going to be seen in six to eight months. And that's how we are seeing it. When we're doing many of these uh, advisory work for uh, mid-segment customers or even large-scale customers as well. Absolutely. Like uh, I would say like anywhere between 12 to 18 months, like you nailed it, like saying that 9 to 12 months would be the right appropriate uh, time frame for us to see some kind of a ROI return on investments and things like that. Perfect. So on that front, like co-creation is very critical. And some of the approaches and some of the collaboration that we need to build a good ecosystem is critical. So deciding between human in loops versus like human on the loop depends on several factors, correct? So adoption is very key. On that front, like I would like to ask like um, Pratish, what do you think is the future of the human machine collaboration is going to be and how are the trade-offs between automation efficiency and the need for human judgment or oversight? So I think uh, it depends on uh, two factors. One of them is the risk appetite of the organization. Mm -hmm. And the other one is where in the maturity the organization is. Mm -hmm. So if the maturity levels are low and they're just adopting technology or AI, from people and technology standpoint both, and they would probably want to start with HITL. Yes. But if the maturity levels are higher and there are good redlining or guardrails that have been established, then they can go to HOTL. So as we all probably know, HITL is more having human in the decision loop itself, and which slows down the process. But HOTL is where you could rely on automation from AI and actually only provide the supervision or the oversight. And you know there are two different things. However, I don't see organizations going either left or right. It, there will always be a hybrid of HITL and HOTL whenever it comes to the point of actually practical implementations. Because I think as somebody said in the conversation before, anywhere there is a strategic decision to make, any critical decision to make, it will always be HITL. The human will be in the loop for that uh, process, decision making, etc. And wherever the process can go on all by itself, that's where I think HOTL will add value. So I see that as an hybrid approach based on you know various factors that I just discussed over back to you. As we are talking about like HITL or HOTL, I would like to like punt this question to Professor Atif to see like why do human AI systems still need humans exploring in the human and loop system? I know it's so, going to be like something like you are going to say like robotics and that you already kind of like answered with your first question, <laughs> but I would like to get like a little bit deeper. <laughs> so HITL in reality that uh, I have applied at Health and Human Services of USA as the uh, Cyquent AI or E-Level AI's uh, mother small language model. <laughs> 
the idea of HITL is accuracy improvement rate, number one. Exception handling efficiency is number two. Data, lab, data labeling throughput and model feedback and in, integration time. So all of that, what Azmat said, I would like to add there here uh, as my next point that we have either the positive response or the negative response or both positive and negative response simultaneously of an answer that is coming through any agentic AI whatsoever. The last, not the least, is neither positive nor negative response comes. And this is standard uh, gate recurrent unit that we use. Again, uh, Azmat put it very nicely that as a practitioner and me as a professor and practitioner combined, I look at all these KPIs, the key performance indicators. And when we go with HITL, if we are not bringing a human or few humans, like at Health and Human Services, we ask them that hammer it with all the questions that you have, you can ask it and then tell us, what do you think as a human? Is it good, bad, ugly, or you know something else? Out of Mars. So the answers gave us in our small language model, which we wrote, because they were not willing to spend money on tokenization and all that, or in Tropic or Chat GPT or whatever. So that allowed us to apply standard net natural language understanding, processing, and generation. And I just shared with you a few of those KPIs. I, I would ra rather ask Soren, Raghav, I know you are the moderator here, huh. to add something here because he's a psychologist among us and he knows better, in my opinion. Anyone has the right view. I think you read my mind like you read my mind. Like I was actually going to throw the next question to Soren for sure. So Soren, um, I want to like uh, take a practical approach and then I want you to kind of like uh, see what are some of the ongoing or improvements that we can address and also turn a twist of saying that there's some of the ethical concerns with not only the psycho uh, psychology being something behind it and how do you think one should handle not only organizations, even individuals? Well, what Atif was talking about before around engagement, I actually look at as how do we engage people from the start? So for example, uh, it was Gallup, I think, did a survey that basically looked at all the companies adopting AI and only 30% of those companies, according to people who were surveyed, had any kind of like AI principles or guidelines mm -hmm. and people were just left to kind of figure out how, what's appropriate or not to put into GPTs and is it private or not? And what's competitive intelligence that you should hold back versus you know, it's so I think that from an engagement standpoint, we need to help people understand the guardrails that will create engagement and it'll create comfort and trust in the systems that will allow people to either be in the loop or on the loop or let the loop just happen so that there's there's trust in the technology if there's a there's an old model called the socio-technical systems theory which is basically you need the social system and the technology to be married up right now we have pretty much gotten enamored with technology and we're leaving the social behind, which is why we're having this conversation. So I think that that really is, you know, the guardrails and the principles and the training around that, very important. When you look at specific applications, um, I do a lot in design thinking and innovation. So how, AI is great for doing market research very quickly. But to understand, are those real customer insights or hallucinations? And what do we do with that, for example, as a team in our product development, that requires another level of judgment. It's not like a make or break decision, but there is some filtering that needs to happen to make it useful. Absolutely, actually, you're true. Uh, like a, uh, spoke like a true psychologist. <laughs> I can see, really see it, the difference you broke down and then very kind of like a Dr. Atif to like point to you. I do have the question for Professor Keith. Professor Keith, like data is very important. We all know that data is golden, everything, it's oil, whichever way you want to frame it. How can we be ensure that like humans in the loop have appropriate data and also that could guide them to make consistent and good ethical decisions? Well, I want to um, 
I want to answer this in a way that kind of keeps the conversation going because so many so many uh, important points were made. I, I loved uh, Soren's point about socio uh, technical systems. Uh, if and I think everybody on the on the panel feels this way. If we include machine learning models, which we haven't stopped doing under the umbrella of AI, I think you can argue that to some extent you've always got uh, a human in the loop. Obviously, there are so many terms. I, I was uh, I was actually before the uh, um, the panel today looking up just the enormous variety of terms over the loop, on the loop, and so on. So. So they can differ in the details, but take a classic use case like um, insurance fraud. Um, it's impossible to have a model like that that doesn't have the kind of uh, uh, socio-technical system that Soren was describing because somebody has to physically, usually an ex-cop or something like that, has to physically get in the car and drive out and, and explore this. One uh, noteworthy project that I was on was uh, staged accidents. That's when cars go through a uh, a red light on purpose, and there's a whole complicated um, fraud surrounding that. So absolutely, that is generating data. And then all that data that comes after the prediction that helped to determine whether that investigator was going to get assigned to the case continues to generate data and all has to find its way back to the data scientist or whomever it is that's building that uh, predictive model. I also want to pick there were some, so many wonderful comments earlier. I wanted to uh, revisit one uh, briefly. Uh, I think it was Asmuth that was, uh, was describing this, that because of this data capture that's necessary, you can expect your workload to temporarily go up. And I always warn clients about this. They're often surprised because they think, oh, gosh, we're going to build an AI model. We're going we're gonna to need half as many people to do this. But because of that feedback loop and that data quality uh, process that I was describing, Often in the first several months or longer, you actually have more person hours going into this as you adjust and fine tune the models. Very true. Like uh, as you mentioned about the fraud happening in the insurance business and then accidents and other things are recreating. I have firsthand experience because my father just ran into something where he was not at fault and then things happened. We had to really prove, luckily for him, since my wife was with him, so they took wonderful pictures and then also where the cars were parked illegally and everything. So we were able to prove even the investigator was very impressed with that. So I really like your analogy and things like point. 